Chapter 9 John sent Cleopas and another young man to bring those who had come earlier, seeking advice about leaving the city. Within a few hours, the apostles' house was crowded with men, women, and children. Of those who had arrived with their families, Rizba only knew Parmenas, the belt maker. Parmenas had arrived with his wife, Eunice, and their three children, Antonia, Capeo, and Philomen. The belt maker owned his own shop in which he displayed the singula, for which he was best known. These elaborate belts, made for members of the Roman army, served as badges of office. The apron of decorated leather straps protected the soldiers' groin in battle, and when the soldiers marched, made such a horrific sound as to spread terror through most adversaries. John introduced others as they arrived. Timon, who bore the marks of a savage beating, was a fresco painter who had run into difficulty when he had been summoned by a priest of the Artemisian and been commanded to paint a fresco honoring Artemis. I refused. When he demanded a reason, I told him my conscience forbade me creating anything honoring a pagan goddess. He was less than pleased with my answer. His wife, Portia, held their children close, looking distressed and fearful. Some men came into our home last night and destroyed everything. They made my mother cry, one of the boys said, his dark eyes on fire. I'd like to make them cry. Hush, Peter, Portia said. The Lord would have us forgive our enemies. The boy looked mutinous, as did his younger brother Barnabas, while little Mary and Benjamin clung to their mother's sides. Prochorus was a baker, and with him were his wife, Rhoda, and his sister, Camilla, with her daughter, Lysia. The man looked harassed, less by persecution for his faith than by the two women who stood on either side of him. Neither looked at the other. Lysia was the only member of the family who looked serene. Four young men arrived, having heard from others that a band of Christians were leaving Ephesus. Bartimaeus, Niger, Tibelus, and Agabus, all not yet twenty, had already received the blessings of their families to go out into the world and spread the gospel. There are voices in our ear, Niger said, but what of Gaul or Britannia? I want to spread the good news to those who haven't heard it yet, Agabus said. The last man to arrive was Nason. Rizpa was immediately impressed by his manner of speech. Eunice leaned close. He's a well-known hypocrite, she said in a whisper and smiled. Rizpa noted the way her eyes shone as she spoke. Apparently, the woman was quite pleased at the prospect of being in the company of a renowned actor. He's called frequently to perform ratings before the proconsul and other Romans officials. Isn't he handsome? Yes, he is, Rizpa agreed, though she thought him somewhat affected. Nason was a man of obvious dignity and polish, his voice proclaiming careful training and deliberation. He drew attention and was comfortable with it, almost expecting it. Nason recited one of King David's psalms to guests of the city clerk who'd gathered for a feast the night before the plebeian games, Eunice said softly, lifting little Antonia onto her lap. Which song did he recite? Psalm 2. Worship God with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the sun. At first... The guests thought Nason was giving honor to their newly deified emperor, Vespasian, and his son Titus, or now illustrious Caesar. Others suspected otherwise. Someone demanded an explanation, but Nason said his courage failed him at that point. He told them the writer had been inspired of God, but that he did not know which God, and the meaning was for each man and woman present to discern for themselves. If you have ears to hear, you will hear, he said. Most of the guests thought it a riddle then and made a game of guessing. There were some who were not amused. Portia joined them. I don't think Nason should go with us. He'll draw attention to us. Rispa thought Nason would draw far less attention than Atreides. The German would overshadow Nason in an instant. Atreides wouldn't even have to open his mouth or utter a word. His physical beauty was enough to command attention, and his fierce charisma fascinated. The only ship taking on passengers is one from Alexandria, Cleopas said. It's scheduled to leave in two days, weather permitting. What's its destination? John asked. Rome. Rome, Prochorus said in dismay. Have you ever heard Nason recite? Eunice asked Rizpa. No, I haven't, she said, wishing the woman would pay more attention to her two sons, Capeo and Philomen, who were arguing over a toy, and leave her alone to hear what the men were saying. The Lord blessed him with a remarkable voice and memory, Eunice said, oblivious to her son's squabblings, her eyes fixed in admiration on Nason. When he became a Christian, he was hungry to learn as much scripture as he could, and he did. He can recite over a hundred songs, and he knows Paul's letter to our church in its entirety. When he's reciting, I feel as though I'm hearing God's voice. I've heard the persecution is far worse there, Parmenas was saying. Are we going to Rome, Mama? Antonia said, 
confused and frightened by the heightened emotions of the adults in the room. Eunice kissed her cheek. Wherever we go, the Lord will go with us, she said, smoothing the girl's hair back. How can we go to Rome? Portia said, her face pale and strained. Who will protect us? The Lord will protect us, Nathan said, having overheard her remark. As he's protected us here, Portia said, her eyes filling with tears. As he protected Statius and Empelius, as he protected Junia and Persis, as he protected Hadassah, she pressed, listing fellow Christians who had been sentenced to death in the arena. Hush, Borja, Timon said, embarrassed by her outburst. She wouldn't be hushed. We've been beaten, Timon. Everything we've worked for has been destroyed. Our lives have been threatened, our children tormented, and now we're to go to Rome where they make Christians into torches to light the arena for their games? I'd rather go into the wilderness and starve. Little Mary began to cry. I don't want to starve. You are upsetting the children, Portia. She drew the two little ones close. What of our children, Timon? Mary and Benjamin are too young to even understand what it means to believe in Jesus as Lord. What happens if- Enough! Timon commanded, and she fell silent, her mouth working as she fought her tears. Rizpa put her hand over Portia's and squeezed. She understood the woman's fears very well, for Caleb was her own primary concern. Hadn't she come here to John in an effort to find a way of protecting Caleb from being used by Certes? She wanted Caleb to grow up strong in the Lord and not in captivity as a pawn to be used against his father. If Atreides or Certes took him from her, he would never have the opportunity to know the Lord. Oh God, show us a way to bring our children out of this. What would it be like to live in a place where one could worship freely without fear? What would it be like to see buildings rise to the glory of God rather than to some empty pagan idol? Rome tolerated every religion conceived by man and denied the very living God who had created her and the world in which her inhabitants lived. Rizba closed her eyes. Almighty Father, you created the heavens above and around us. All other religions are man's attempt to reach God. The way is God's attempt to reach every man, giving up his throne and becoming incarnate. Every religion man created brought him into bondage, while Christ stood, arms outstretched in love, already having set men free. Oh, Father, why are we so blind? In Christ Jesus, we are free. We need not fear anything. Even a slave can have wings like an eagle and soar into the heavens. Even a slave can open his heart, and God will dwell within him. Why can't we accept the gift without question and be convinced that no walls, no chains, not even death itself can hold captive the mind, heart, and soul that belongs to Christ? It took hearing Portia's fears to make her see her own failings, where she herself too often erred. You are my sustenance, Jesus, my life. Forgive my forgetfulness. She felt joy bursting within her, a swelling bright and warm that made her want to cry out in exultation. Even fear can be used to God's good purpose, John was saying, his gentle eyes on Portia. I was afraid of death the night they took Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane. I despaired when I watched him die. Even after I knew Jesus had arisen, I knew fear. When my brother James was cut down by the sword on Herod's order, I was afraid. Jesus had given his mother into my keeping, and I and the brethren needed to get her out of Jerusalem to safety. I brought her here to Ephesus, where she remained until she went to be with the Lord. He smiled sadly. We've all known fear, Portia, and still do at vulnerable moments in our lives. But fear is not of God. God is love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Jesus Christ is our refuge and our fortress against any and all enemies. Trust in him. Rizpa could feel Portia relaxing beside her. John's words of assurance were a mere reflection of the assurance of Christ within him. It was impossible not to believe in the presence of the apostle. But what about later? Timon came and stood behind his wife, one hand on her shoulder, as they all listened to the apostle speak. Portia put her hand over Timon's and looked up at him. Persecution drove us from Jerusalem, John said, but Christ used it for a good purpose. Wherever we go, be it Ephesus, Corinth, Rome, or even as far as the frontiers of Germania, he said, smiling at Rizpa. The Lord himself goes with us. He is our provision as we carry the gospel to his children. Germania, she thought. Surely it could not be the barbaric place she had heard it was. As the men talked over plans to leave Ephesus and Ionia, Rizpa gave in to exhaustion. Curled on her side, Caleb held close. She slept. Some time later, Caleb awakened her, hungry. As she rose, she noted that someone had covered her with a blanket and left the brazier burning. The others were gone. As she nursed Caleb, she went to the window and looked out. The man was no longer standing beside the building down the street. Cleopas entered. You're awake. He's gone, 
she said, turning from the window. Someone replaced him several hours ago. The new man is in the Phantom across the street. Sit. You'll need to eat before you leave. You haven't much time before you must return to Atreides, and have much to tell you before you go. I'll awaken Lysia. She's agreed to exchange clothing with you. She's going to leave with a bundle Caleb's size. Hopefully, the man outside will follow her. He left and returned a few minutes later with a tray of food and a pitcher of watered wine. While she ate, he explained the details of what had transpired the night before while she slept. The final arrangements are being made as we speak. All you need to do is take the information to Atreides and be at the ship by midnight tomorrow. Do any of those accompanying us know how to reach Atreides' homeland? No, but John has gone to speak with a man who was in Germania ten years ago. His name is Theophilus, and he mentioned wanting to carry the gospel to the frontier. If he chooses to go with you in Atreides now, he can guide you. If not, he'll be able to draw out a map and give instructions of how best to reach his destination. I don't think I've met him, Cleopas smiled. You would remember him if you had. 